I was working for the Associated Press, looking for a foreign assignment. I started in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, was transferred to the foreign desk in New York, um, which was where all foreign correspondents were sent first. Yeah. And um, we never knew where we were going, but Vietnam was certainly high on the list. Sure. And um, I was there for roughly a year. Um, before the AP asked me to go to Vietnam. And I arrived in Saigon in October 1969. October 69. And so, and then how long did you stay in Vietnam? I was there for two years the first time. Wow. And then I was transferred to Washington. I was in Washington for six months. And there was a, a major offensive in Vietnam called the Easter Offensive. And uh, it looked as though uh, the South might fall. And um, the AP scrambled to get people back there. And, and uh, I was one of those who got scrambled. And I went over and stayed until the emergency was over. I was there for six months and came home in November wow. of 72. And when you were there, were you in the Saigon area the whole time? Or did you travel all around South Vietnam? No, the way we worked in the AP, the AP had the largest bureau uh, for both photos and writers uh, in Vietnam. Yes. And um, the way we worked is we all had apartments in Saigon, and that was the base. That's where the bureau was. Um, but um, there were always at least three field reporters. Um, that is, we were war correspondents who were assigned uh, two weeks on the desk in Saigon, editing copy and uh, uh, writing things we might have of our own, but primarily editing others' copy. Uh, two weeks uh, working in the north, based in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. uh, the north, I, I should say, uh, people don't know this these days, the north was the northern part of South Vietnam. Um, and then uh, two weeks uh, wherever we thought we could find a story, wherever there was, uh, you know, some action going on or we had a story idea we wanted to follow up on, something like that. Hmm. And uh, so that was the, the basic framework. So uh, I, I spent a fair amount of time traveling around. We, we carried um, a military identification card, which identified us uh, as journalists, but it uh, got us onto military aircraft and... Um, and that was always uh, tremendously helpful in getting around the country. And is that, so that is the primary way you got around was by uh, basically going along with army convoys or flying on Air Force planes from place to place to place? It varied, but uh, during the period when the Americans still had uh, several hundred thousand troops there, yeah. um, <clears throat> the logistics were certainly easier for us if we, uh, if, if we, you know, traveled with the American forces, uh, and it was the bigger part of the story for us. So um, hmm. I would say that, you know, in the first year or so, most of my travel would begin, say, if I were in Saigon, um, I'd go out to Tansonut Airport and catch a flight, probably a C-130 or something, going to some other provincial capital. and uh, and then, you know, join a unit somewhere, often by helicopter, uh, sometimes literally by hitchhiking with usually U.S. troops on the move. Um, oh, yeah. And, um, yeah. you know, we would basically get a permission from a commander to, to uh, go out with his unit. And, uh, and we would go out... Uh, until we got a story or until they came home or, you know, mm, uh, yeah. whatever, whatever seemed uh, the best at the time. Yeah. How, how would you describe the, uh, the relationship um, between, you know, journalists and the military at that time? Uh, that's a general question. And then I wonder if uh, a more particular question, if there was a difference in the relationship between you as a journalist and the sort of these senior officers and the junior soldiers. But maybe start with the broader question. How would you, and of course you're talking about two very different periods. I mean, 69, as you indicated, the US has still a, a, 
a lot of troops on the ground. By 72, the Vietnamization process is well underway. These well, are by 72, troops. there were very few ground forces left. There were still, you know, a fair yeah. amount of uh, aircraft and, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, there were still some air cavalry units and things like that until yeah. the end of 72. But, yeah, the, uh, the American presence, and particularly its combat presence, was, was much, much reduced. Significantly reduced. And, well, how, uh, would you, how would you describe the difference then? I mean, the, the general question being relationship uh, between journalists and uh, the military. But I, so I guess we could apply that question to the two different times you were there. Um, if you notice well, the difference, I'm interested in that. Um, let, me, let me try to address that if I can. First uh -huh. of all, um, you're right to ask about, you know, senior officers versus grunts, um, because there often was a difference in the way we were, um, we were perceived. But when you went to a unit, um, particularly if you sought out the unit for you know, some reason that uh, they had troops in contact maybe, or um, you heard about a story you wanted to follow up on in their unit, you never knew when you approached uh, um, a, a commander whether uh, he was going to throw you out of his area of operations because you were losing a war, or whether he wanted to invite you in and and you know uh, you know uh, tell you that every soldier he had in his unit was a hero and he wanted you to write a story about every one of them. Mm -hmm. There wasn't there wasn't usually a way to predict, but of course, yeah. being the military. Um, and particularly with the Marine Corps and the Army, um, there was always a public information officer involved somewhere. Uh, the commander would, or one of his people in there, either as a guide or an advisor, or, you know, um, we often called them minders. And uh, they were usually junior officers for the most part. Mm. Um, and then there were the grunts who, you know, often could not figure out what the hell we were doing there as volunteers without weapons, and what were we following them around for? Was there any uh, sense of resentment that, you know, if there's an ambush and you got hurt, then, then they would have to take care of you, but you weren't a combatant, and so you could be a liability, but not necessarily a contributor if there's an ambush or something like that. Was there ever, ever any sense, did you ever hear anything like that? You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that view wasn't um, expressed among them. I cannot recall a single instance mm. when I was ever asked to leave a unit or told I wasn't welcome because of uh, my position. Mm. I think more often I was a curiosity to them. I'm talking now about the, uh, uh, well, actually, I, I, I would make this a fairly general statement. I, I, I was... Uh, almost always welcome, um, and often with that sense of uh, awe or curiosity about why I was there. Hmm. Um, but often also because uh, a lot of people were anxious to tell their stories, and hmm. <clears throat> those stories might have been pro-war, anti-war. Uh, more often, they had to do with the unit itself um, and what they were doing, what their job was. Yeah, uh, I never had. <clears throat> I was very fortunate in never having uh, been in a position. First of all, I wasn't wounded, thank goodness. And um, uh, while we were sometimes a burden, uh, um, that wasn't usually expressed to us. They had a lot of other burdens. Oh uh, sure, most yeah. of them weighed a lot. You know, yeah. <laughs> ammunition boxes and things like that were, were yeah uh, uh, were pretty serious burdens. But. Um, uh, there were times, certainly, when they gave me guidance about, you know, how to, uh, how to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very grateful for it. Yeah. Um, but, did you, uh, anyway, that, that gives you some idea, I think. Yeah. Did you, <clears throat> did you feel that um, some of the that junior soldiers were sometimes more frank and honest because they weren't thinking about career implications of what they might be saying? Oh, sure. You know, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think that um, senior officers, particularly you know, commanders, executive officers, um, operations officers particularly, uh, were very sensitive about 
what they said and, and how that was going to be viewed at, at uh, you know, by their superiors. Yeah. Um, especially after it got in print, and I knew they had no control uh, over what we said mm -hmm. in our story. Um, whereas, uh, yeah, I don't think that, I don't think the enlisted men generally worried much about that. They, no. they might have worried to some extent about what they said or how they were portrayed, but yeah. Um, not, yeah. not about the broader questions of career. Yeah. Um, now, your second time, since there are, you know, relatively few uh, U.S. ground forces, then were you um, tagging along more than with South Vietnamese forces or, or also still primarily with Americans? Oh, uh, during, well, actually, I, had, I traveled with South Vietnamese forces uh, throughout my, my time there, but okay. um, it, with the Cambodia invasion in uh, 1970, um, I did go in with the South Vietnamese uh, uh, mechanized infantry unit across into Cambodia and across, across the countryside. Um, and in that case, um, there was an American advisor with the unit. Um, and uh, I stayed reasonably close to him. Uh, I didn't have you know, command of the language, and neither did he. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he had certainly uh, people he was in constant contact with. Um, yeah. And that sort of helped shape the pattern of when I did go in the field with, with South Vietnamese forces. Um, toward the end, and well, certainly in 72, um, there were very few Americans still engaged in ground combat. Right. And, um, and uh, I was quite often on my own trying to find uh, uh, people to travel with and units wow. to work to. Uh, um, I guess one of the one of the more interesting cases that I I recount myself about myself was on my thirtieth birthday in uh, September nineteen seventy two. Um, there had been a question for weeks about whether the South Vietnamese had been able to retake the citadel in Quang Tri, which was the, the old historic fortress in the province capital of Quang Tri, the northernmost uh, province uh, of, in South Vietnam. Yeah. And um, I set out in the morning uh, from Saigon, quit smoking, um, that day, celebrate my birthday. Hmm. Uh, uh, went out to the airport and flew uh, north to Da Nang, where I uh, hired a car and uh, went over the High Van Pass to the uh, the old imperial capital of Way. Way, yeah. Um, which was the the last major city on the way to Quang Tri and uh, picked up a jeep that the ap kept rented there at that time we had an apartment which we used wow. because we had very little other support there and uh got in the jeep and just started driving north and uh up route one uh, up route one exactly yeah and um you know crossed the bridge and and went on up uh as, wondering how far i could get heading for Quang Tri city and, uh, you know, it got a little hairy toward the end of the day, but I seemed to be, I was pretty sure I was still in government territory most of that way. And the closer I got, the less certain I was. But I was planning to get to, uh, uh, hoping to get to Quang Tri Citadel to, to see if it was really in the hands of the South Vietnamese forces by that time. Yeah. Very, very heavily bombed by American and South Vietnamese uh, um, air forces. And uh, so I, I knew it was, you know, pretty much of a wreck. But it had been, it, you know, this, the, uh, the North Vietnamese had occupied that citadel for, by that time, I believe, I stand to be corrected, but I think it was 99 days. Wow. And um, so, you know, 
before I got there, my no smoking vow had uh, evaporated. <laughs> but uh, I, I just kept kept on and kept looking for signs of South Vietnamese troops. And damned if I didn't actually drive into the citadel on that day and was uh, it was basically reduced to rubble. There wasn't much there, but there was a South Vietnamese battalion that had uh, uh, taken it over probably in, in, in the pre-dawn hours of that day. And, um, and uh, they welcomed me and I was glad to be there and glad to know that they weren't shooting at me. I think it was pretty obvious by the time I got there yeah, that uh, the the U.S. military um, was was maintaining a fiction, at least for our benefit, and I think its own, mm -hmm. um, and that things were just not going as well as the military wanted you to think. Whether it was in some small uh, uh, engagement with the enemy and some, you know, at a say company level or platoon level or on a much more grand scale. Um, and um, yeah, I think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I thought it was hopeless, but uh, I had written about Vietnam when I was in college and, and wrote it in, during that time about a fair number of people, uh, including people like Bernard Fall, who was one of the early real experts on um, military operations in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, and people like that who, who did not see a way that the South Vietnamese were, gonna, were going to pull off a victory. One of the principal things was that there was certainly a, a, a consensus among most of the people I dealt with um, in, in the uh, press community, and uh, to some extent, I didn't deal a whole lot with the embassy people and the diplomats and so on, but, but certainly enough to know that there wasn't a lot of con confidence that the South Vietnamese government was sustainable. It was, corruption was a big problem. Yeah. Uh, it, it had uh, its own struggles with its populace, particularly because so many of the, the um, uh, the top officials of the government were actually northern Vietnamese ruling in the south. Mm. Northern being that they came down in 1954 mm, and the Geneva Accords were signed, you know, were signed in, in 54. I'm sure you've heard Vietnam veterans um, who express, I'm trying to think of a good word. Uh, there's probably a better one, but I'll just use the word contempt. Uh, for the media who say, for example, I mean, a, a famous instance would be Walter Cronkite after Tet, um, you know, making his famous editorial statement. Um, yes. You know, we're not winning, we're not losing, looks like we're stuck in a stalemate. And, you know, the, the Vietnam vets will say, you know, the we had multiple enemies, the North Vietnamese, the Viet Cong, the protesters, and the media. Um, what, I'm just wondering what, what how, I, I'm sure you've heard this, you know, many times over the years. Oh, never. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What is, what, is, what is your response to that? Well, first of all, um, uh, I think that one of the greatest mistakes of the U.S. military, the officer corps, um, was its failure to understand the lessons of Vietnam. And, and it taught in its many, many training areas from West Point to Command and General Staff School and the War College, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, uh, uh, that Vietnam could have been won under different circumstances if, you know, the press hadn't lost the war for him by changing the, the mind of the people at home and, you know, all of those stories that, that uh, lived for, for a long, long time and, and, and still do, still, uh, do yeah. still, still do in, in the officer corps. And um, 
you know, I think it's a dreadful mistake, but it has held for a long time. Who else were they going to blame? Mm. And blaming the messenger is not an uncommon thing. Mm. Uh, however, what really was, what really was going on that I did not see much of when I was in Vietnam was, of course, what was going on on the ground in the United States. The most stunning stuff for me was to see how huge and how violent and how how bitter the opposition to the war had become mm. after I left. Um, when you get into 1971? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, when I when I left in '69. Yeah. There was certainly an active anti-war movement. I'm not pretending sure. that there wasn't. Right, but yeah. it became so much more serious. And by the time of the Cambodia operation, um, one of the reporters who I had great respect for, who had been an AP war correspondent in Vietnam uh, and had gone back to New York and had been in New York for a couple of years, and he came out to Phnom Penh um, to write about the, uh, uh, you know, the Cambodian side. And he, I met him when he came to, to Saigon. And uh, he said, you really don't understand the situation. It, it, you know, the, the head of the AP and a lot of people uh, are very much afraid of a revolution. That you know, by this time there were I don't know a hundred college and university campuses closed um, by protests over Cambodia and you know the events events leading up to it, and um, uh, Congress was in an you know uproar over um, the expansion the extent expansion of the war into yet another country. Yeah, um, and uh, um, I, I think that all. That, that was a very sobering thing for us to hear mm -hmm. that the United States itself was feeling very uncertain about what was going on. When we were in the field, um, you know, and, and uh, in the company of GIs, um, uh, we certainly had tremendous respect for them and what they were doing. And uh, a lot of them, wore peace symbols on their helmets and, you know, anti-war slogans and things like that. But, hey, these guys were out there doing a job and, it was, you know, doing their duty. And although I did write stories, uh, including some in 1971, um, about fragging and low morale and drug use and things like that, that had certainly become uh, much more commonplace among the troops left, by, you know, left to go. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I think we always had a tremendous respect for the people we were working with and dealing with and following. And, yeah. Uh, coming home, uh, those guys often didn't find the same situation at all. And I think some of that is, I, I've spoken a lot about it, uh, written it in the book and, and since. Uh, about what what became of uh, those guys when they came home and how bitter they are even to this day. The last major military engagement of the Vietnam War for the Americans was an attempt in that began on February seventh, nineteen seventy one, to invade Laos cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was the principal supply route of the North Vietnamese, and, uh, and try to cripple the North Vietnamese that way. Um, and they, by that time, Congress was so anti-war that there were no uh, US ground forces allowed to cross the borders. But they winked at this by providing the air support for South Vietnamese units that were to cross the border on the ground. And, and uh, and go in and cut off the trail with U.S. air support. They'd be some of them went in by ground, some of them went in by air. Yeah, one of the units that was flying uh, reconnaissance for for all of those units. In fact, it was the first unit uh, that did cross the Laos the, the Laotian border that morning. Was Sea Troop, uh, 
uh, they were they called themselves the Condors. It was a, right. it was an official nickname. Yeah. Um, and um, I came into contact with that unit uh, first because a a Vietnamese helicopter carrying four Western uh, uh, photographers and one South Vietnamese combat photographer uh, and a couple of senior South Vietnamese officers was shot down uh, very early in the operation. I think it was on the 10th of February. Um, and uh, I heard, I was covering what had happened. I knew the people on board. Uh, mm. And I heard that, um, uh, that there was an American pilot who had witnessed the shoot down of this aircraft. And um, so I went looking for him. And the forward headquarters of that unit was at Quezon, which had been the old Marine combat base, which was reopened for this operation because it's very close to the Laos border and right. was the for forward headquarters for the, for the Americans and the South Vietnamese, uh, uh, you know, for, you know, going on that operation. Yeah. So uh, I went looking for this guy, I had his name, and I went into what was called the AO, the Area of Operations, where their, their little forward headquarters was. And I asked to see Major Jim Newman, um, who was the commander of the unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, a guy went into the Tactical Operations Center, which was basically just a little uh, secure box. Um, and uh, this guy came out, he was he was he was not a very uh, powerful figure, a commanding figure. Uh, mm. When I first set eyes on him, he was short. He had uh, thinning hair even then in his thirties, and you might sense that I'm sensitive to people who have thinning hair. And um, uh, and he walked with a limp that he couldn't conceal. And uh, so. Uh, so I, I told him that I had heard this story. I said, I, I heard do you witness this. Is that true? He nodded his head. And this is one of those occasions that I spoke of earlier when you never knew whether the guy was going to throw you out on your ass for losing the war or invite you in to be, you know, to write about his heroes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I did, and Newman was very uh, cagey, when, you know, he, but he nodded his head. And I said, is there any chance that there were uh, survivors. And he shook his head. And he looked up at me with, I don't know exactly how to describe it. I've sometimes said it was a smirk. It wasn't really. But it was kind of a sideways smile. And he said, you want to go see? I said, sure. Newman was under direct orders, as were all American commanders in that operation not to take any civilians and especially not correspondents across the border. So he was, he was living dangerously for his career. You know, to, have, uh, to, to violate that order could have gotten, gotten him in very serious hot water, uh, mm. whereas it would not have got me in serious hot water unless he um, didn't get us home uh, because I was no, under no such rules. Um, and so, of course, I said, sure. And we turned around, headed for his helicopter and, and uh, climbed aboard. And he flew me over the crash site. Wow. Um, so that was my introduction to Major Newman and, and, and Charlie Troop. Uh, and and uh, because he did that and his men knew about it, it gave me a certain entree over the next several days, many days of that operation, that I could go in and uh, talk to these guys and they knew who I was because I had interviewed the major, right? So if I was, I, if I was okay in the eyes of the old man, um, you know, they were often, they often felt free to talk to me and, and yeah. uh, it provided some important stories. The first real stories that I got about how difficult the situation was on the other side of the border mm. uh, and how, how, you know, these guys were taking very heavy losses. Because of the North uh, Vietnamese defenses. Because the ground defense, yeah, the North Vietnamese anti-aircraft defenses uh, were, they, they had been designed to defend the Ho Chi Minh Trail against 
what we called fast movers, the, the jets. Uh, you know, the, the fixed wing bombers and fighter bombers and yeah. P-52s, well, yeah. they, they didn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, anti-aircraft that could get to the B-52s, but yeah. for, the, for the others that were flying lower, yeah. you know, they were, uh, they were designed for that and helicopters were sitting ducks by comparison. Yeah. So they, they were taking heavy casualties and getting badly shot up. And, uh, and yet they were, they were flying uh, back and forth into this uh, very difficult situation, uh, hour after hour, day after day. Many of these people came home, coped with whatever they had to cope with, got jobs, went back to school, did all those things that you know, uh, young young men did in getting started with their uh, careers and their families and so on. Um, and uh, and they went on and they worked and they were occupied. They raised their kids, with, you know, all of those things. Um, and then toward the end of their careers, when they had more time, um, they they weren't they weren't so pressed uh, by their work and so on. Um, one of the things that that time provided was time to think and sort of remember. And I think this is a pretty natural thing for. I don't, uh, uh, I, I don't, I haven't done any studies on this, but I think it's a pretty natural thing for people who are, who are changing at the end of their careers. Um, they start looking back and uh, remembering good times and bad. And, uh, and I happened to come in on this as it was happening to a lot of these guys. And they were becoming more reflective than they had ever allowed themselves to be. And then when I would ask, one of these simple questions like, how are you doing? They would answer it in a way that they'd never been asked. I remember a young man from Rutgers that came around a few days after the notorious shoot down of 4 July 71. That's when his, his scout helicopter was shot down. Mm. I remember him riding a scooter, something like a Honda 50 at the time. But my memory is very foggy about that part. I just remember him asking me a lot of questions. I was a little reluctant to talk since we were in the ready room. I, I was not sure what to say. Anyway, I did contact Rutgers maybe 10 to 15 years ago and asked them if they had any record of such an inquiry. The young man, more than likely much older than I was at the th that time, I think uh, this guy was 19 when this happened, and uh, asked them if they had any record of such an inquiry. The young man more than likely was much older than I was at the time, was from their psych department. And I am guessing he wanted to see how being shot down affected people. I do remember a lot of his questions, but never heard anything about the, quote, interview, unquote. Do you know he was the only person who ever asked me about what happened? That is, besides you. Hmm. No one, and I mean no one, ever asked me what happened that day. Not a single soul. Only you and that young man from Rutgers ever asked me what happened as I experienced it. Guess it was a way of telling me I was a nobody. I wonder if you would lose your leg or not. Then to be with others who had lost legs, arms, faces, been burnt, had gaping holes in their bodies, was an everyday part of life. Those of us took care of each other. We were close. We cared for each other. Mm. From the experience I had being at the hospital in Da Nang to Valley Forge, and he met Valley Forge, of course, was a veterans hospital where, where he was after he was evacuated. It was completely different from what I experienced at Sea Troop. Like I said previous, not a single soul asked me what happened on 4 July 71. It was as if I didn't matter. That veteran expresses to you a sense of gratitude for being one of two human beings who asked him, who showed some interest. Uh, it's obviously important to him that you did that. And I hope that veterans who hear this, who are reluctant to share, I hope that, that they will. And I hope that they'll, that they'll realize that there are people out there who aren't interested in prying into their personal business, but who are interested in hearing their stories as human beings.